Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln on this Sunday morning. My name is the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. Whoever you are, whatever your age, your skin color, whomever you love, wherever you are, whenever you are, as you watch this, know that you are welcome here and that we are so glad you are with us. It is good to be together. Each week since the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic last year, our congregation has gathered together at least twice. On Thursday night, when we tend to our community and each other directly on Zoom. And in this service on Sunday morning, broadcast on YouTube. Sunday morning, whether in person or on YouTube, is a chance to proclaim who we are and what we're about throwing open the doors of this congregation and proclaiming the radical love and welcome that is at the heart of our faith. The Unitarian Church of Lincoln, we say, aspires to be a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual exploration to transform ourselves and the world. And as spring comes this year, vaccines are distributed, and we start to think about what comes next for this church, we're considering some big questions. What are our commitments? What are we becoming? What is our story? These are questions that define us and will continue to do so in the future. And churches are generational projects. But right now we don't have to look far into the future to ask what our next steps are. In these closing months of the pandemic, as we look to the future and plan our return to this building, we gather together in hope. There is work to be done, beloveds. Let's be about it. The chalice lighting this morning is by Katie Gelfand. The end is the beginning. We call forth the light, the life of our faith by igniting our chalice. The spark of new beginnings invites us into a sacred space to reflect where we have been and where we are going. Even knowing that this particular flame will intentionally end with our ritual ex extinguishing, we fear not its end. For we know with brave hearts that from every ending of our lives, we are sent forth to make a new beginning. This is from the uh, reading is from the Constitution of the Unitarian Society of Lincoln, Nebraska, April 1891. Article one, this organization shall be known as the Unitarian Society of Lincoln, Nebraska. Article two, our object is to study and practice religion as the law of love and duty for all mankind. Article three, this society shall never adopt any articles of faith or creed as a test of fellowship nor require its members to acknowledge any authority in matters of doctrine or faith subversive of the sacredness of personal conviction and the right of conscience. Article four, this society is congregational in its usages and as such is independent in its government. 
in Article 5, any person seeking our fellowship and desiring to do good is welcome to our society, and we ask him to pledge his fidelity to the cause here represented and to become a member by subscribing his name here too. Each week we take up a collection to support this congregation and its programs and its partners out in the world. It's an important gesture of support for this place. An acknowledgement that we all grow and are transformed by our interaction with the church. And an acknowledgement that the church is made up of the contributions of all of us. That is the heart of what it means to be a democratic institution like this. It is not my church, it is not the Unitarian Universalist Association's church, it is the church of the members, the church of the Unitarian Universalists of Lincoln. That gets expressed in big ways in congregational meetings like the one that we're having this afternoon, and in little ways when we take up an offering every week. So as this next song plays, you're invited to give, you can either go on Realm, um, our, our congregational database, or you can send us an email, or you can text 73256. Hopefully I've got that number right. If I don't, we'll correct it underneath me um, with UC Lincoln and the amount you wish to give. Thank you for your generosity. The offering will now be gratefully received. from the Reverend Sean Parker Dennison from the book Breaking and Blessing. Love is too much for one poem. It bears repetition, needs it to get to all its complexities, the things that make you wonder if anyone believes or begins to fathom it at all. How could they? Things are never what they seem, never what one hopes when love is involved. All the possibilities are only that, only things that could be, and nothing really endures because love changes us all, every one of us. Things are never what they seem. Three plus three is suddenly seven, and things that were are no longer, and yet we endure because we long for love and keep faith with it beyond all boundaries, all hope, all reason. Love is too much for one poem. But still we try. We cannot help ourselves. The subject demands it of us, demands our greatest effort, the work of an entire lifetime. Though we know these words will never be enough and our effort is destined for failure, still we capture what we can and love. The work of love demands our greatest effort. Every week we set aside part of our service to share the joys and sorrows of our lives as part of a gathered community. 
We do this because it's one of the ways that we see love working in the community. We see the network of interconnection that is so often implicit in what we do. When we name it, and we name our loves and our losses, we make that implicit web explicit. As this next song plays, we invite you to type the name of somebody that you are holding in either joy or sorrow, it could be yourself, into the chat box running next to this video. Thank you for your presence. My name is Kurt Donaldson, and my job has been to figure out what did the Universalists of Lincoln believe? What made them different from Methodists and Baptists and uh, Presbyterians? And it really boils down to one thing, that they believed in universal salvation. And it was a radical idea then, and it's a radical idea now. And if you want to know just how radical, listen to this bit from a sermon done by Thomas Ballinger in 1887. He was an Iowa minister speaking at a, uh, at a funeral in Iowa. And I'll just, we'll just join him in progress here. The writer was called to attend the funeral and to the family and a large assembly of neighbors and friends endeavored to encourage all to put their trust in God and hope for the grand results and the final development of his purposes towards all our race. A portion of the first of first John fourth chapter was read from which the words God is love in the 16th verse were selected as a motto to discuss the nature, wisdom, power, and final consummation or completion of God's love to mankind, that all are children of one common father, who made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and sent his son to die for all. And that life and immortality were brought to light through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And Christ having risen from the dead, a safe and sure guarantee that all will may be made alive in him. Here's where it gets radical. 
But knowing the prejudice of some against any being saved unless they have a certain kind of experience before death, the speaker, having some knowledge of the human race and the unnumbered millions that have died without a knowledge of Christ here, and if ever benefited by his death and resurrection, it must af be after they enter the next world. And the very idea of narrowing down God's love and the labors of Christ for man's salvation to this little world and the very few, comparatively speaking, that are converted in a Christian country, in Christian countries, is a sad compliment to God's love and the universal sacrifice of Christ for the sins of the whole world. Now that's radical. My name's Marianne Meisner. The first Universalist Society of Lincoln was organized on September 1st, 1870. At a meeting at the home of Mrs. J.D. Monell, six other people decided to bring the society to Lincoln. Those present were Mary Monell, Julia Brown, William Holmes, Laura Pound, Samuel Tuttle, and Reverend John and Sarah Parker. Reverend Parker was elected president and Mary Monell was elected secretary. She turned out to be the dynamo that made things happen. As the direct result of her efforts, Mary Monell got the ball rolling. She spearheaded the building of a chapel at 12th and H Street, which was dedicated on June 23 of 1872. The first minister was Reverend James Gorton when the great cornerstone was laid in October of 1871. He resigned two years after the, because of financial crisis, which affected the whole country in 1873. Services were random for 10 years, 1873 to 1883. In March of 1883, the Universalist Convention sent help in the person of Dr. Reverend Eben Chapin. He slowly began building the church community. By 1893, a new sandstone church had been built at 12th and H Street. Great financial hardship followed as a result of the national financial crisis and local financial problems. The only viable solution to save the building was to apply to the Unitarians for their sponsorship. This happened on May 27th, 1898. Wow. Oh, what? here's a list of the ministers from uh, 1871 until now. Um, James Gurdon, uh, Evan Chapin, J. Lewis Marsh, Arthur Weatherly, James McDonald, Edwin Palmer, Carl Storm, Phil Shug, Isaiah Domus, Peter Rabel, and Charles Stevens. So this is interesting. There weren't any interim ministers uh, before that time, but right after Charles Stevens, uh, there was a series of interim ministers. Uh, Jay Atkinson, Arlie Bircher, Louise Robick, uh, Lisa Schwartz, Fred and Marge Kipe, and then Fred Campbell. Uh, and then uh, the church uh, brought in a settled minister, and that was Fritz Hudson. Uh, and Fritz was followed by interim's Laura Shenham. That's when I started uh, attending church, was when Laura was interim. Uh, Justin Osterman and Gretchen Woods. Then settled minister Oscar Sinclair, and he's still with us in 2021. But now listen to this. It's from 1964. And uh, let's see, Victor Seymour wasn't a minister of the church, but he was a hero. Here's a quote from longtime church member Mark Buckholtz, who actually just died a couple of weeks ago. With the death of Victor Seymour last December, this church suffered an incalculable loss. So dedicated was Vic to the ideals of a liberal church that in a very real sense, he devoted his life to them. He served the denomination in a multitude of capacities from top to bottom, and he achieved a position of lay leadership that was eminent in every sense of the word. It will be a long time before another Vic Seymour comes along, perhaps never. We will miss him and will never forget him. Wow, so many wonderful leaders in our church story.
what a list. Hi, I'm, I'm Frank Edler, and guess what I found in the time capsule? My hero, Arthur Weatherly. He served for two ministries at All Souls Unitarian Church, one from 1948 to 1919, and the second from 1929 to 1942. In 1915, he participated as a delegate on the Henry Ford Peace Ship that traveled to the neutral countries of Europe to set up a mediation committee to end World War I. This sketch from a Swedish newspaper shows him addressing a Swedish audience. He was persecuted for his pacifism by the Nebraska State Council of Defense that informed Washington that he was not fit to serve in the war camp community service, which was actually an early version of the USO uh, in South Point, North Carolina. Church members rallied behind him and supported him in Washington. Weatherly served splendidly during the war. And after the war, uh, he invited W.E.B. Du Bois to speak at the church before a black and white audience on the mistreatment of black soldiers during the war. Uh, in his second ministry, he helped establish the Lincoln Urban League in 1933 to assist the black community. He was president of the Urban League from 1933 to 1938. This photograph shows Weatherly in his later years with his wife Clara and his son Jack in New Hampshire. I am woman, hear me roar in numbers too big to ignore. I am woman, hear me roar in numbers too big to ignore from Helen Reddy's 1972 hit describes the spirit, accomplishments, and the number of Universalists and Unitarian and Unitarian Universalist women who have served our church from its beginnings 150 years ago. Whether or not they were members of the Ladies' Aid, the Women's Alliance, the Alliance Guild, the Mothers' Club, or the UU Women's Federation, UCL women have made the personal political and the political personal. As you may remember, half of our founding members were women. Through the years, the names of many women stand out. Our guiding light, Mary Monell, of course, as well as those who came later. The Bullock sisters, Flora and Edna. Sus Suzette LaFleche, known to her Omaha tribe as Bright Eyes, and Margaret Seymour. That's Victor Seymour's wife, author of the history of our church's first hundred years. Inez Philbrick, who received her medical degree in 1891 and served as resident physician at the university for 17 years, worked tirelessly alongside Clara Weatherly for women's rights to vote. There's, there are many women whose names are not so well known or not known at all who raised money for the church, explored the curriculum of cakes for the queen of heaven, cared for children, gave sermons, joined protests, wrote letters, supported their families, their church and their community for 150 years. They have deepened the conviction in my soul as the song goes. In today's time capsule, I'd like to add a tribute to all of the invincible women who have served and continue to serve our congregation. Hello, um, my name is Craig Immig, and uh, for my um, look in, at the time capsule of our church, I would like to uh, recognize some names um, of people who are instrumental in the um, uh, beginnings of the um, organization called Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays, or PFLAG, as it's also known. And um, these were um, heroic pioneers um, who were um, predecessors of uh, the um, uh, LGBTQ welcoming committee um, that is um, going on um, today and is um, quite active um, in uh, many uh, uh, things that are have been going on. And so here, here are a list of some of the names of these um, uh, folks uh, here that um, 
some of you who have been around for quite a while will remember. BJ Wheeler, um, Eileen Durgan Clinchard, um, the Werners, the Kimberleys, and um, also Alan and Lois Hansen. Um, one last thing about Lois Hansen, um, also back in the 80s, um, she was um, my uh, psychology teacher at Lincoln East High School. I'm Kathy Disney. When I look into the time capsule, I see people, regular people, anonymous people, so many people I couldn't list all their names even if I knew them all. I see local community involvement. I see members and friends of our church working for 150 years to make Lincoln, Nebraska a better place for all its citizens. I see the Fresh Start Home and the Interfaith Housing Coalition. I focused on these organizations in my fireside chat. Why don't you go and see all our fireside chats on the church's YouTube channel? I see supporting numerous local organizations through our Share the Plate program and donations of time and labor in cleanups at the President and Ambassador, volunteering at the Daisy, and packing food at the Eastridge Food Pantry. I see scores of church members and friends through the years getting out and doing what needs to be done to improve our community. I see time given by regular people going all the way back to 1870. These are my heroes, the heroes whose names are not recorded. They are the ones who do the small, anonymous work that over time creates a better church and a better community for everyone. My name is Harry Hafer. You've heard some wonderful, fantastic things about a lot of heroes. The heroes who their fortitude established a liberal free religion in Lincoln from the first wooden Universalist chapel on 12th and H to the later larger red sandstone building on the same lot. And for over 60 years, that red sandstone building was a great home for the members of the church and all souls. But unfortunately, deferred maintenance, which we've experienced in our own building, <laughs> was pretty evident by the 1950s. So it didn't make any sense to make the repairs because the, it wouldn't really provide any additional space for uh, the church activities that was needed. So the planning committee started a search campaign and they wanted to raise, suggested to raise sufficient, sufficient funds to purchase a 2.3 acre site at the eastern edge of the city where we are located today at 63rd and A. So in May 1957, the congregation voted with their pocketbooks to purchase the tract. An interesting thing, there's a fun drive notebook that you can see pictured here. They started on January 13th, 1958 with a goal of raising $30,000 and a challenge goal of 40. But by the end of the campaign a month later, 101 church member heroes pledged a total of $51,574. The Brown groundbreaking at 63rd and A was held on June 1960, and the cornerstone was laid on a cold winter December day six months later. An interesting quote from Roger Dickinson uh, is, is his words ring true today. This was from the last service held at 12th and H. We are grateful to those who gave of their substance and their lives that this congregation might persist in the past. We are grateful to those who gave and who are giving of their savings of a lifetime and their wages to enable us to buy the land and start a new building. Like Mary Monell and the group of seven founding members and, and all of our past and current members and friends, they are the heroes who have continued to support and sustain the UU faith and physical presence in Lincoln for 150 years through their continued con contributions and pledges. And this continued support is shown through our recent energy efficient addition and renovated building where we live up to our principle of respecting the interdependent web of all existence. This addition and renovation were built looking toward the future. So perhaps in 50 or 150 years, church members will look back and be once again grateful to those who gave her their wages and continued to provide an increased meaningfulness for this community and its members.
As this worship service concludes, I'd like to extend an invitation to the membership of the Unitarian Church of Lincoln to attend our spring congregational meeting on Zoom. The link to that meeting is in your e-blast. We'll get started either at 11 or or, uh, just after this service, depending on how long it ends up being. Um, We're a democratic faith. We've heard stories about this congregation and the the storms it's weathered and the triumphs that it's had over the last hour. And this is how we do it, by gathering together as a community to take up the business and the and the vision of the congregation. Right now we do it twice a year, once in December when we talk about our budget and once in the spring when we talk about the year that was and the year that will be and we elect new board members to serve. Uh, it's an important meeting. It's going to be a chance to really talk about about what this past year has been for us. Uh, it, it's been... <laughs> when 50 years from now, a committee does the 200th anniversary celebration of the Unitarian Church of Lincoln, they will point to this year that we've just been through as a, uh, as a signal point in the history of the congregation. So come be a part of that. Come to the meeting, vote, and uh, and come with questions. I'll see you in a couple minutes there. Let us extinguish the chalice with the words of Dr. Curtis W. Reeves, given at the 50th anniversary of All Souls Unitarian Church on April 25th, 1948. Let us remember that no particular philosophy or theology of the nature of the universe is prerequisite to religious living. Many may be helpful, but no particular one is essential. Let us remember that no particular tribal or ethnic religion is sufficient for the needs of today. And let us remember that no particular social, political, or economic theory is exhaustive of possibilities in societal arrangements. With an attitude of inquiry, 
implemented by scientific method, let us move forward towards the future.